This is part one of a two-part video lecture on Richard III and the relationship between language and power. Let's begin by looking at a brief quotation from another one of Shakespeare's plays, the prologue to his history play Henry V, where he gives us some insight into how language works in drama. The prologue speaks, Think when we talk of horses that you see them, printing their proud hoof in the receiving earth, for tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings. In other words, the words that the actors speak create in the minds of the audience the reality of the play. This notion of words as creating reality is essential, is central to the notion of what a playwright does. Notice the spelling, W-R-I-G-H-T. What is a right? As a noun, a right is a craftsman or an artisan, someone who writes or builds. You might think about wrought iron, that is iron that has been worked, that has been crafted. So a playwright is not someone who writes plays, W-R-I-T-E. It's someone who crafts plays, who builds plays. And what are the materials that they use? The words themselves. The words are the materials to be wrought, to be worked on, to be crafted. And these words themselves, again, create reality in the mind. Richard of Gloucester takes full advantage of this power of words to create reality because he is, in many ways, a consummate actor. He performs in multiple roles in this play, and he changes to suit the occasion. He is different depending on what is needed and whom he's talking to. And he is a master of speech and linguistic play, a master of manipulating meaning throughout the play. We can see this in his opening soliloquy, where we have this play of oppositions, as you can see highlighted here. Winter of our discontent, glorious summer, clouds that lowered, buried in the ocean, bruised arms become monuments, stern alarums become merry meetings, dreadful marches become delightful measures. So he plays with these oppositions, and he shows how one thing can so easily turn into its opposite just by saying it. His words enact the transformation that he's describing. So he's showing just how flexible meaning is and how reality, or our perception of reality, is subject to the language that we use to understand it. And if we look just a little bit closer, even at just a couple lines, the first two lines of this speech, we can see just how deep the meanings are embedded within Richard's speech and how much he can play with meaning and how one statement by Richard means so many different things. It can mean its own opposite. If we read just the first line, now is the winter of our discontent, it seems to so forcefully say that the discontent is now, by starting off with that strong word, now is the winter of our discontent. It is happening right now. And he uses the word our, which might suggest the royal we, when kings and monarchs speak in the first person plural. So we can get a sense that Richard is already imagining himself king and he is discontent because he has not yet fulfilled that imaginary desire. But when we read the lines together, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by the son of York, that enjambment creates two different meanings, creates the meaning of just the first line, but then the second transform line where we see the discontent has passed and it is actually now summer. So we move from now to a different now. And the son of York is, of course, his brother Edward, the king, who is also his opponent. And there's just the little pun on son, S-O-N, son, S-U-N. Edward is the son of York, he's the child of York, of the family, and he is the son, S-U-N, that has made the winter into summer, which is, of course, part of uh, Richard's grand irony. He prefers the discontented winter. We can see a little bit later on in the speech just how intensely is Richard's destabilization of meaning and language, that it operates at the most fundamental level. When talking about how he will convince his brother, King Edward, to arrest his other brother, George, the Duke of Clarence, he says, This day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. Edward thinks that this G means George, Duke of Clarence. He thinks that 
one of his brothers is going to murder his heirs. But of course, it's the other brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, that is the murderer. So at the level of the letter itself, even the letter G does not signify what we think it signifies. How can we take anything to be true if letters do not mean what they are supposed to mean? We can look a little bit closer just at that phrase, of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. If we were to restructure the syntax, it's essentially saying that is, shall be the murderers, shall be the murderer of Edward's heirs. So, and Richard does order the murder of Edward's heirs. He is the G who murders Edward's heirs in order to solidify his claim on the throne. But Richard and his brothers are also of Edward's heirs. That is, they are all descendants of Edward III a few generations back. So the G of Edward's heirs, the person named G, who is one of Edward III's heirs, the murderer shall be, or shall be the murderer. And the murderer of whom? Of Edward's heirs themselves, of his own brothers. So we can see how the multiple meanings in this line, in this prophecy, perhaps even go beyond what Richard himself realizes, how it tells us all these different truths that Richard is an heir of Edward and will murder Edward's heirs, both his brothers and the heirs of his brother, Edward's. And this leads us to the theme of prophecy and what we think of as misleading prophecies and dreams and other signs in this play. For example, Clarence's dream, when he thinks that Richard is still on his side, he has this very suggestive dream, methoughts that I had broken from the tower and was embarked to cross to Burgundy. And in my company, my brother Gloucester, who from my cabin tempted me to walk upon the hatches. Methought that Gloucester stumbled and in falling struck me that thought to stay him overboard into the tumbling billows of the main Lord, Lord, methought what pain it was to drown. And here Clarence, again, he still thinks consciously that his brother Gloucester is his friend. But the dream tells us that perhaps subconsciously, or perhaps from some other realm of knowledge, he is being warned. Because in his dream he is tempted by his brother Gloucester, and who else tempts us? And rather than having seeing his brother Gloucester actually strike him and drown him purposefully, he imagines it to be a stumbling, a falling, an accident. But Clarence will shortly be drowned at his brother Richard's command. So the irony here that he has a prophecy that he misunderstands, a dream that he misunderstands, but it tells him the truth in a way that he cannot quite accept or that he can't interpret, as many other figures in this play will have dreams that prophesy the future in some way or another. Another example of Richard's powerful manipulation of language comes in his interactions with Lady Anne. Now, in the previous plays in this cycle, Richard murdered Henry VI, who is Anne's father-in-law, and Prince Edward, Anne's husband. And he woos her through the manipulation of his language, despite the fact that the body of Henry VI is laying there in front of them. We might ask ourselves, without a male authority or a monarch to anchor language, to anchor meaning, is Anne susceptible to the mysteries and vagaries and ambiguities of language? Is it because she does not have this male authority to govern or to anchor truth? We can look at a little bit of their interaction and notice how they play off each other. Lady, you know no rules of charity. Villain, thou knowest no law of God nor man. Fairer than tongue can name thee, let me have some patient leisure to excuse myself. Fouler than heart can think thee, thou canst make no excuse current but to hang thyself. By such despair I should accuse myself, and by despairing shouldst thou stand excused for doing worthy vengeance on thyself, which did unworthy slaughter upon others. So everything he says, she is trying to respond, she's trying to transform it. She's trying to change his words and control the meaning of their conversation. But notice how Richard takes charge of this linguistic battle. Oh, he was gentle, mild, and virtuous, the fitter for the king of heaven that hath him. He is in heaven where thou shalt never come. Let him thank me that help me that help to send him thither, for he was fitter for that place than earth, and thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else, if you will hear me name it, some dungeon, your bedchamber. So first, 
Richard transforms his act of murder into an act of help, of blessing, that he has sent Edward to heaven, which is, of course, a good thing. And then when Anne tries to condemn him to hell, he changes it to her bedchamber. And it's through these sorts of manipulations that he woos her, that he transforms everything she says and makes his actions seem to have been done for something else. He even says, I did this all for you, so you are the one who has caused this. And it's that transformation through language that makes one thing seem like another, that makes a different person seem like the cause of an event, that makes his motivations seem other than they were, that enables him to ultimately woo and wed Anne. Now there is one figure who rivals Richard for his linguistic power, and that is Queen Margaret, who is, like Richard, something of an outsider. While Richard is vis visually and physically deformed, we're told, Margaret is the widow of the former king who has been overthrown. And as such, she's a figure of memory. She's associated with the past. She's also a figure associated with loss and death. And she lays a number of prophetic curses upon people's heads, including Richard. For example, in one scene, Richard and various others of the members of Edward's court are disputing with each other. And Margaret is overhearing it, and she's commenting on what they say. And these are all asides. That is, they do not hear these words. The other characters do not hear her speaking these things, but we, the audience, hears them. Richard says, "'Tis time to speak. My pains are quite forgot. No one remembers what I did." Margaret says, "'Out, devil, I remember them too well.'" And his pains are the people he's killed, her husband and her poor son. And he says, "'To royalize his blood, that is, Edward's, I spilt mine own.'" And Margaret says, "'Yea, and much better blood than his or thine. You spilt the blood of my family.'" And Richard says to his associates, let me put in your minds, if you forgot, what you have been ere now and what you are, with all what I have been and what I am. And Margaret defines what he is, a murderous villain, and so still thou art. And here we have the first part of Margaret's curse. She says, if not by war, by surfeit die your king, that is, by excess die your king, as ours by murder to make him a king. And King Edward does shortly die after and is accused by Richard of gluttonous sexual appetites. That's one of the things Richard does to solidify his own rule place on the throne. Edward thy son, for Edward my son, die in his youth by like untimely violence. And Richard does have the new Prince Edward murdered in the tower. To Elizabeth she says, Thyself a queen, for me that was a queen, outlive thy glory like my wretched self. Long mayest thou live to wail thy children's loss, and see another, as I see thee now, decked in thy rights, as thou art stalled in mine. And Queen Elizabeth will be supplanted when Richard becomes king and makes his new wife, Anne, queen. And, of course, her children will be killed by Richard. Margaret goes on, Long die thy happy days before thy death, and after many lengthened hours of grief, die neither mother, wife, nor England's queen. And again, Elizabeth is widowed, her children are dead, and she loses her status as queen by the end of this play. And Margaret then tells Richard Rivers in Dorset, As you were standers by, as you allowed these murders to happen, I pray that you all are murdered yourselves. And they are killed by Richard in his machinations. So Margaret, and she goes on to then curse Richard and predicts, of course, many of the things that will happen to him. So Margaret has access to a certain truth, and she has a linguistic power of her own. She's able to draw down these curses that seem to have a kind of metaphysical or supernatural power behind them, as opposed to Richard's more playful uh, playing within the system of language. Margaret is drawing on some divine supernatural power outside of language. Richard, on the other hand, plays with appearances. Just to review the topics that we've talked about in this first part, the connection between words and the psychic realities that they create is very important to Shakespeare. He's always exploring what is it, how is it, do words work to create meaning, and how can that meaning be tampered with? So in this play, we see the play of language, and we've seen it through a few things, through misinterpreted prophecies and dreams, through unstable truths or truths that can be changed through perspective.
And of course, the power of language that we see in seductions and curses, the power of language to affect the real world. And some questions we might ask ourselves now before we go into part two, what gives Richard of Gloucester his linguistic power? And why does Richard lose this power when he becomes king?